Teddy, I need to talk to you for a second. Come here. Yeah. I need to ask you to stop using my Instagram. Listen, listen. Why is my algorithm filled with cat videos? Maybe I did that. Why, hello there, endurance nerds. Have you ever finished a VO2 max workout, watched a new video on interval density, and ended up wondering if everything you just did was totally wrong? If so, you're in the right place. Okay, maybe that's just me. But I'm dragging you into my rant anyway, so deal with it. Don't tell me what to do. Let's just rip the band-aid right off, shall we? Fitness influencers are lying to you. Okay, not all of them, but a lot of them. And not necessarily with malice, just with laziness. With a surface level understanding of the science, a common section to feed, and a business model that thrives on looking definitive, even when the nuance matters most, it is way easier to say things like, this routine is a game changer, or the only recovery protocol you need, than it is to explain how training actually works in messy real life bodies. And when you try their latest overhype plan, follow every rule, eat the gels, wear the fitness tracker, buy the four figure sleep pod, and then still don't get faster, you don't blame them, you blame yourself. You think that you must be broken, that you're not recovering well enough, or training consistently enough, or maybe you're just not cut out for this. But the truth is, you're not the problem, the framework is. You already know I reference science and research all the time on this channel. I believe in evidence, I believe in data, and I absolutely believe that science is one of the best tools we have to understand how our training works. But I've also learned how to actually read the research, not just the headline or the press release, but the methodology, the sample size or end size, the design, the funding, and yes, the occasional conclusion that may contradict the actual data that it's reporting. And what I find over and over again is that a lot of these studies, while useful, get misapplied, misunderstood or blindly turned into rules that don't hold up when you zoom out from the lab and drop back into real life. This video is not about bashing science. It's about cutting through the really bad translations of it, the oversimplified, influencer-approved, engagement-farming versions, and actually showing you how to interpret it intelligently. It's about knowing when the research helps you to make better decisions and when it's being contorted into one-size-fits-none advice by people who haven't actually read past the abstract. Damn! We're going to talk about what training science can get wrong about real life athletes. Not because the science is fake, but because context matters. And most of us aren't 24 year old lab rats with access to catered meals, 10 hour sleep cycles, and lactate testing on speed dial. So if you've ever felt like you're doing everything right and still not getting faster, this one just might be for you. Here's the part that rarely makes it into podcast summaries and Instagram carousels. Most training studies are done on either elite or sub elite athletes or total non athletes. There's almost no in between. You'll find a study saying three weeks of sprint intervals increase VO2 max by 12%. And then you check the fine print and realize the participants were previously sedentary males with zero training background. Yeah, of course they improved. They're breathing Cheeto dust before this. Their baseline was, I got winded walking to the mailbox. So yeah, adding any stimulus is going to look like magic. On the flip side, we get studies using elite cyclists or national level triathletes training 12 to 20 hours a week with dialed nutrition, perfect sleep, zero children, and the physiological profile of Marvel origin story. The results are probably valid for them, but they tell you exactly jack shit about what's going to work for someone training six hours a week around a full-time job in a house that apparently can't go 24 hours without needing some sort of maintenance. Neither of these populations represent the middle. And guess where most of us live? That's right, it's in the middle. You're not untrained and you're not elite and you're not recovering between workouts with a sleep pod and three nutritionists. So when someone mentions a study, the first question should be, who are these people? And are they anything like me? Because if not, those effect sizes and protocols might be as relevant to your training as the Tour de France is to your daily commute. For instance, imagine a VO2max study where only 12 participants completed a six week program, half dropped out, and the researchers only measured those results at one time point. Suddenly a single outlier who responds incredibly well to sprint intervals can skew the average improvement number. That's not a fake scenario. It happens all the time with small sample sizes. When we see a headline saying 35% improvement in aerobic capacity, that might have come from one or two super responders while everybody else saw 5%, but nobody writes about the 5%. They write about the 35%. This is also why you've tried three training plans in a row and none of them felt quite right. They weren't made for you. They are made for tightly controlled test subjects who don't have your job, your stress, or your impact predictable schedule. And then ironically, you walk away thinking that you're the failure when really the design was just a bad fit from the start. Now, let me repeat myself here. I am not here to bash the science. The physiology is real. The adaptations are real. Training fundamentals like progressive overload, energy system specificity, and periodization exist because we've heavily studied how bodies respond over time. When we can replicate trends and responses across different study groups and over long timelines, then we can have a much higher degree of conviction in discussing these topics in terms of population averages. In those well-studied areas, we have found that through all the noise in the research, we can still draw some pretty solid conclusions that hold generally true. We just need to be mindful of replication or lack thereof. 
and more broadly, that research has limitations. There are funding constraints, study durations are short, sample sizes are small, and the more precise the protocol, the less flexible it becomes for the real world. No study accounts for, I didn't sleep because my dog had diarrhea at 3 a.m. Or, I did my threshold intervals after an 11-hour workday in a surprise parent-teacher conference. And let's not ignore correlation versus causation. A study might show that athletes who do X intervals exhibit Y improvement, but it doesn't always prove that the intervals were the sole cause. Maybe those athletes, sometimes as a result of the study design itself, or the Hawthorne effect, had better nutrition, fewer life stressors, or simply enjoyed intervals more and thus executed them with more consistency. The data can't always capture those confounders, but it's really easy for the conclusion to be, look, X automatically equals Y. Science gives us signals, it gives us guardrails, but it doesn't give us guaranteed results when removed from the conditions of the study. You can understand that threshold training is effective without needing to replicate the exact prescription from a six-week Norwegian study on Olympic hopefuls who didn't even have to cook their own dinner. And let's not even get started on how many times the conclusion section of a study reads like someone trying to explain the fact that their intervention didn't work. While the results were not statistically significant, trends suggest a possible benefit in certain subgroups. Translation, it didn't work, but please don't take away our grant. Now, here's where influencer culture really starts to poison the well. Most research isn't sensational, it's incremental, but a lukewarm headline doesn't get clicks. So someone reads a study summary, posts a hot take on social media, and suddenly we're all repeating shit like, sweet spot is junk training, zone two is all that you need, high intensity is better than threshold, Threshold is better than high intensity. You should only train polarized. Wait, actually pyramidal is better. And those become absolutes instead of starting points. The influencer economy thrives on certainty, not on nuance. But when you treat averages from small studies as universal truths, you're not training smart anymore. You're just cosplaying as a lab subject without any of the controls. The reality is that multiple methods work. What matters is how they fit into your life, your training history, and your ability to recover. But that nuance is boring. And boring doesn't make for clickable thumbnails or viral tweets. So instead, we get headlines that overhype effects size and cherry pick results. And before you know it, some influencer with a fancy logo is telling you that your entire training plan is shit because one lactate clearance study done on six guys in 1999. Meanwhile, you're stuck thinking if all of these scientific approaches contradict each other, maybe I'm just not cut out for this. Spoiler alert, that's exactly what drives the cycle. Conclusion leads to more views, more opinions, and more product sales. But it sure as shit doesn't lead to better training. Here's the real stuff. The variables that no study or influencer ever fully accounts for. Your job, your sleep, your stress, your travel, your family, your hormones, your immune system, your mental health. Heard enough yet? These are not footnotes. These are central inputs into your ability to train, recover, and adapt. A 60-minute sweet spot session hits very differently when you've had eight hours of sleep, ate a good breakfast, and started at 10 a.m. with no meetings ahead versus when you're underfed, underslept, overworked, and emotionally one inconvenience away from setting your bike on fire. Now layer in the influencer who's never met you but insists their protocol is the only way and you've got a recipe for self-doubt. This is why two people can follow the same exact plan and get wildly different results. One might be in near lab conditions, the other is barely holding it together. And yet we blame the athlete, not the unrealistic framework they were handed. So how do you use the science without falling into analysis paralysis or turning your training into a failed replication study propped up by clickbait headlines? Here's what I'm going to recommend. First, read past the headline, know who was studied, how long it lasted, and what the actual intervention was. Because polarized does everything might just be a snippet of the six month study done on novices. Second, use principles and not prescriptions. Understand why a method works, not just what the protocol was. There is a vast difference between VO2 max intervals raise your aerobic ceiling and you must do five by three minutes at 120% or else. Third, track your own responses. If it's working, you'll feel it. If it's not, no amount of study show will bail you out personalized approach beats the influencer's half-baked universal prescription every single time. Fourth, adapt based on reality. You are not underperforming because your week doesn't look like a published table, okay? You need to adapt the science to work with your life, and that's called being smart. The best pros do it. Why shouldn't you? And finally, think like a scientist. Ask yourself, what's the control group here? Could something else have caused these results? Does the conclusion match the results? Does this protocol apply to my training level? Approaching studies with simple but critical questions is often enough to spot the difference between a genuinely robust finding and a clickbait claim. Use these steps and you should never again feel trapped by some random protocol that doesn't align with your life. The influencer model wants big flashy claims that fit neatly on a reel, but the best athletes I know use science to guide their decisions, not justify their suffering. They adapt, they test, and most importantly, they don't treat every paper like it's the Ten Commandments of Threshold. Remember that confounders never show up in the flashy summaries, things like randomization or lack thereof self-reported data, 
or inconsistent monitoring. If an influencer is citing a sketchy study that doesn't track these factors, you're already off the rails. This is what I mean by context matters. A small sample with sloppy methods can twist outcomes and make it look like a miracle protocol until you realize that half the group dropped out, the data was self-reported, and the one super responder skewed the average by 20%. At the end of the day, training science is awesome, but it's a tool, not a template. If you've ever tried to follow a research-backed protocol and ended up tired, confused, or raging Pop-Tarts in your kitchen, you're not broken. You're just not a lab subject, and you're definitely not a lazy influencer looking for that next viral one-liner. You're a real human with a real life, and if that means you need to change the plan to stay consistent, healthy, and not completely cooked, that's not a compromise, that's smart. Now, as we land the plane here, it's worth acknowledging that creators, including people like me, do have a responsibility to their audience. Having a platform, whether it's big or small, carries a moral obligation to ensure that information that we share is not only well-researched, but also clearly framed as fact versus interpretation. We are not debating life or death issues here, but the principle is the same. If we're going to encourage people to do something, anything, we should strive to be accurate, thorough, and conscious of the very real consequences our words can have. It is easy to post a hot take or latch onto a flashy headline, but taking the time to verify sources, weigh counterpoints, and acknowledge limitations, that prevents a lot of misinformation and misunderstanding, a process I see all too rarely these days. To that end, my commitment to you is very straightforward. When I present a concept or a piece of research, I'll do my level best to show where it comes from, what the data actually says, and where my own opinion begins. Will I get it wrong sometimes? Absolutely. If I do, I'll own it and correct it. But my goal is to reduce, if not eliminate, those errors by not rushing to comment on every trend or rumor. Instead, I'll gather enough context, think critically, and make it clear when something's tentative versus well-established. In other words, I'd rather slow down and get it right than pump out content that sounds definitive but leads you astray. And I hope you hold me and every single other creator out there accountable to that standard. But let me know what you think. Do research studies give you whiplash? Have you ever felt fatigued by trying to navigate the morass of fitness influencer hype to find the truth? I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comment down below. And while you're down there, do me a favor and hit all those YouTube-y buttony things. Thank you all so much for watching. And as always, I'll catch you in the next one. See ya.